a simple uh, job um, and a very, ples very pleasurable job for me to introduce Peter Hall, um, who I will simply say is just one of the best writers on design there is right now. One of the best people just writing about design uh, with intelligence and with accessibility. And it's that is difficult. Peter does it. He does it without um, sliding into trite journalism on the one hand and without sliding into equally trite academia on the other. I have great respect for his writing. Um, to give you put a little bit of bio biographical context here, Peter is a de design writer. He's a senior lecturer and uh, the head of the design department at Griffith University at the Queensland C C College of Art uh, in G Griffith University in Brisbane. Before moving to Brisbane, he was a senior lecturer in design at the University of Texas at Austin, where he taught design theory, history, and journalistic methods of research and writing, where, where his rich research focused on um, mapping as a design process, and he's done some extremely sharp uh, writing on this. Between 2000 and 2007, he was both teaching at Yale School of Art and he was a senior editor and fellow at the University of Minnesota Design Institute, where he co-edited with Jan Abrams the book Else slash Where, Mapping New Cartographies of Networks and Territories, and where he organized several symposia and workshops on mapping. Um, in that same period since 2000, he's been a contributing editor to Metropolis, to, sorry, to Metropolis magazine, and has written widely about design in its various forms for publications including print, ID magazine, the New York Times, uh, and The Guardian. He wrote and co-edited the books Ebor Kalman, Perverse Optimist, Sagermeister, Made You Look, and Pause, 59 Minutes of Motion Graphics. Since 2006, he's been vice president and co-organizer co of Design Inquiry, a nonprofit educational organization devoted to researching design issues at an annual gathering at Weber uh, Inlhaven in Maine. That's the bio. But I want to give you a couple of sentences of Peter's from a paper uh, which has the delightful title of True Cost Button P Pushing. True Cost Button but Pushing. It's about Henry Dreyfus and Dreyfus's um, work as a d designer and Peter's uh, evaluation of how Dreyfus attempted to negotiate with the forces of what we might call consumer engineering within mass culture. But he has two important sentences towards the end of this paper which epitomize something about a way of thinking design which I think can be highly profitable for us. The first one, towards the very end of the paper, says, thinking design, virtually saying, design as the making of assemblages within, s with it, within systems with consequences. So design as the making of assemblages within systems with consequences. The second one kind of is an adaption of that in a way. It comes a little bit to it. Let us imagine for a moment, he says, a design history that posits design as a cognitive act, as Jamie Hunt d d describes it, an act distinct from writing and possibly a different kind of machine for thinking. Now, it seems to me that those two sentences together, this notion of assemblages within systems which have consequences, but also that design is a kind of, not writing, but a kind of thinking, a machines for thinking. If so, the question is, what is it thinking about? I think actually, what I think it's about is thinking about our relationships to the artificial in the broadest sense. But I do think it's about time we did start to think of designs, not just as dumb things, but as actually assemblages for thinking. And on, the, on that note, let me introduce Peter.
Thank you, Clive, uh, for that um, lovely introduction, uh, and and Susan also. Uh, I really would much rather you know talk about the things that have just been talked about um, than uh, give you a, uh, what I've prepared. Um, but I, I think I shouldn't uh, attempt that. So there'll be plenty of opportunities. Uh, um, so I'm going to um, first uh, explain that I stumbled off a double red eye at uh, 5 a.m. this morning from Australia. So this could be a little bit surreal for me, but hopefully not for you. <laughs> um, and um, uh, just that it feels really great to be uh, back in New York uh, and among kindred spirits and what feels sometimes to be like a sort of a, a sort of center of discourse. So I'm, I'm very happy and uh, thankful uh, to Parsons uh, for bringing me here. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, as uh, uh, Susan gave, uh, gave you a great um, uh, uh, overview of, of what I'm going, going for. Oh, oh, no. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, so I, I'm going to just jump straight in. Uh, I, I thought this was a good place to start. Uh, Kurosawa's masterpiece, Rashomon, uh, which I'm sure you all know. That I was a bit horrified when I uh, asked students uh, in Brisbane who'd seen it, and only one uh, person raised a, a hand tentatively, and that, that was a, actually a tutor. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, I, I'm going to assume you all know it, um, uh, and I, I love it because it's a model of the past as fluid, subject to interpretation, and not a place in which truth can ultimately be located. Uh, four witnesses tell these wildly conflicting stories of a, a rape and a murder uh, to the despair of a priest who is appalled at the lack of selflessness in each uh, storyteller. So the truth never emerges in the film. Oh, oh. That's interesting. Uh, although the priest's faith in humanity is restored uh, when one of the witnesses, a woodcutter, in an act of altruism takes custody of an abandoned baby. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, if this keeps cutting off, I guess we'll have to do something, but hopefully if I keep wiggling the, the um, mouse, we'll be okay. And I just threw up there two useful uh, quotes, I think, to bear in mind as I, as I, as I ramble through this. Um, so uh, Michel Cerez and Bruno Latour's uh, lovely phrase, the past is no longer out of date, which sort of, in my mind, reactivates the past as a place that's sort of doing things in the way that we respond to it. And then, uh, as uh, Norman Fisher uh, puts it, the past is always changing. Uh, so this notion of the past as, a con as, as continually changing, but also in which the search for single, a single cause uh, in history making is, is proven uh, fruitless, uh, which is what really happens in um, Rashomon. Uh, so so um, uh, in Rashomon, this search for a single cause uh, is superseded by the need to restore balance. Um, and that's central to Taoist and Buddhist philosophy. Uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, illness is analyzed in terms of patterns of effects. Uh, people are healed not by surgically eliminating the, uh, uh, the culprits of their illness, but by restoring systemic balance and flow of qi or energy. And so in design history, similarly, I'm interested in approaches that look to discover by combining theory and my background is journalistic research, uh, constructing webs or networks and webs, you know, I'm glad Susan mentioned that Latour quote about sort of weaving, so webs or networks of effects. And I'm curious about the extent to which these approaches draw from older Eastern philosophies, though I won't, um, I won't uh, uh, dwell on that. And I'll try not to dwell on the uh, uh, vanishing image. I'll just sort of keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, so by contrast, um, Western history or traditional or normative design history might be rudely characterized as a, a series of attempts to exclude most of the past in pursuit of a, a singular causal chain, which once determined becomes the fossilized narrative. So just to, to dwell on that a little bit, a linear great men and drum and trumpet, as we call them, narratives, in which uh, uh, design and architecture movements like wars have defined causes, fixed canons and heroes, are arguably, I'd like to think, are being superseded by more dynamic, evenly balanced causal webs and networks. So to write a dynamic relational history, 
means we have to dispense with the idea that there is a past that will somehow reveal its secrets to us, a history that uh, demands we obey its laws or lie down before its evidence. And that's coming from uh, the radical historian Keith Jenkins, who characterizes as absurd the idea that there is a historicized past existing independently of our various present-day concerns. Uh, this sentiment isn't so far from that of uh, the mainstream historian uh, John Vincent, who points out that the past uh, is no longer there, that all we ever have to work with is uh, the evidence left behind by um, uh, particular societies, and they're usually literate ones. Uh, a key, then, to visualizing how this relational history I'm arguing for, um, as opposed to a linear uh, narrative, might work is the map or diagram as a means of discovery and representation. Uh, unlike an epic narrative, a map of an historical event has no explicit hero. There's, there's no hero in this map. It simply arrays the evidence, who and what did what to whom, when and where. And at heart uh, is this belief that how things work is more interesting than what they signify. At least that's, that's what I think. Uh, the way things work is more interesting than what they signify. Uh, that the mechanics of agency ultimately reveal far more um, than efforts to decode and align representative meanings within uh, larger periodical pictures. Uh, and, and a very big, big, big influence in my thinking here is James Corner's essay, The Agency of Mapping, um, uh, where he alights on this map, um, uh, Minard's map of the fate of Napoleon's army in Russia during the winter of 1812, and refers to it as providing clues uh, for a rhizomatic mapping in the sense that it incorporates different space-time systems of analysis um, and, and it's, a, it's rhizomatic in this, he uses Deleuze and Guattari here, um, in that it's not like a tree, uh, it's an A-centered, non-hierarchical and continually expanding um, uh, sense across multiple uh, terrains. Um, now, uh, this, as I say, is a sort of clue toward a rhizomatic mapping. Uh, Corner uh, backs off saying this is a rhizomatic mapping, even though it sort of vaguely resembles a ginger root uh, growing. Uh, <laughs> Um, because uh, you know it is also fixed, which is not the point. You know uh, the idea that it's continually expanding is is key here. Um, but it it, um, it does manage to synthesize a, a complex amalgam of facts and interrelationships. So you've got the size of the army, that's the width of the line, uh, going uh, to Moscow and then coming back in black. Uh, the locations they go through, uh, the times of battle. Um, and the, the sort of general vectors of movement. But then uh, agency, uh, just to touch on, uh, again, uh, what Susan raised in the introduction, is extended then to non-human actors. And that's, that's a, a nice thought, considering this is a uh, you know, 19th century map. So non-human actors play a part in this map. And so we've got topography, weather, and temperature, all of which impacted this, this, this uh, sort of fateful march. And then, of course, the passage of time. Um, so it, uh, it, as I say, it's not perfect. It represents it's a sort of closed system, if you like, and it's all too easily uh, reduced to a singular narrative of Napoleon's hubris amid crushing winter temperatures. But as a visual and conceptual form, I think it, it presents an intriguing model of what a relational history might begin to look like as a dynamic and systemic field. And by contrast, I thought I should bring in a, a whipping boy for today. <laughs> Uh, Nicholas Pevsner's hugely influential Pioneers of Modern Design, first published in 1936, which historicizes by uh, privileging representation, selecting and aligning the particular works of particular people in particular places at particular times as universally representative. In short, its, uh, its, its central device is the synecdoche, the use of a past to represent the past. So the persistence of Pe Pevsner's legacy, I'd argue, is, is evident in the language used in the introduction to the current edition by Richard Weston, who considers it uh, essential to the understanding of modern architecture and design. Uh, Pevsner sought to show, Weston argues, that the modern movement's clean lines, crisp forms, and new sense of space were the basis for a universally recognized style. There it is again, that word. 
And as such, uh, it was meant to be the natural expression of the age of science, industry, and the machine. So we then can ask, uh, to whom and what system is this book essential? What is meant by a universally recognized style? And why are we to consider clean lines, crisp forms, and a new sense of space, the salient points of a narrative of design history? One tactic is to critique the dominant model by situating the authority. Pevsner, German art historian, Jewish descent, relocated to the UK during the Nazis' rise to power, chose to argue that there'd been a direct flow of influence between the Crystal Palace, 1851, London, and William Morris towards what he believed was the ideal building style for the future, the low-cost, unadorned approach developed by the Germans after World War I exemplified in uh, uh, the work of Gropius and the Bauhaus. German modernism, he argued, was the result of three key influences, Morris, steel buildings, and Art Nouveau. Uh, many historians have sought to uh, distance themselves from Pevsner's history, now a kind of dogma, without ever really dismantling it. I think we're still, obviously, under its shadow. Uh, the Crystal Palace part is compelling if we choose to linger only in the West, and the Western conceit that the present is correct. And I'll come back to that phrase, uh, present is correct, uh, a little bit later, because that uh, brings in some nice uh, Michael Serez thinking. Uh, that somehow this building uh, exemplifying a culture in search of functional technological solutions to material conditions and its use of steel and uh, sort of glass and iron, its rapid construction through prefabrication, um, was, was, was sort of uh, synecdochal of, of, of uh, universal progress. Uh, so, um, in a way, uh, I think I've been listening to one of those in our time broadcasts um, that BBC do on uh, social Darwinism, and I keep thinking how relevant the sort of social Darwinism and Darwinism is to this notion of a sort of progress and removal of ornament in this sort of a normative narrative. Uh, that there was a, kind of somehow this idea that there was a Darwinian evolution from Morris through Art Nouveau to German modernism. Uh, and many critics of that, obviously, Timothy Mowell is one who calls it obvious nonsense uh, and uh, cites Morris's, William Morris's differing legacy on British design uh, versus German design. And uh, among, uh, among the characteristic details of Pevsner's argument are, uh, I'd argue, its styles and periods frame of reference. Uh, positing that one period's decadent eccentricities somehow shocked the design world into a counter-reaction, uh, Pevsner's missionary zeal, and it's oculocentric, um, or spectacular, you might say, Euro Eurocentric perspective. So it's about you know, the image of the thing, uh, which has long been a beef of mine. Um, uh, <laughs> Pevsner sought to find amid this morass of events that took place between 1851 and 1936 some strands that would help position the UK and Germany at the forefront of design progress. That's why I wanted to situate him there in the UK a couple of slides ago. And then to do this by visual means. And, and he does this because he's an art historian. Uh, his, his training was in the analysis of images. Uh, design history, as we know, emerged as a sub-discipline of art history, and many observers pinpoint its moment of coalescing in the UK in 1977 with the formation of, of the Design History Society. And I, I, I've, I've gone on elsewhere about um, you know, why I think it's time for design history to shake itself free from the legacy and the shadow of art history. But uh, you know, to sort of summarize in one uh, phrase, it's because of that focus on the image of the thing instead of the thing. Uh, Kjetil Fallon does a nice job in his uh, recent book uh, summarizing the problems with this conventional art history of design as an excessive attention to aesthetics, which overshadows the many other aspects of design, a tendency to view, to view designers as artists or auteurs, and products as creations or oeuvres, and to consider the best of these the primary subjects of study. And, as he puts it, a very restricted subject matter, largely limited to object categories that have traditionally been affiliated with art. As a counter to this entrenched approach, uh, Fallon observes the increasing prevalence of alternative framings that bring non-design perspectives to the field. Notably, and I think this is, this is why it's a thrill to be here in the design uh, studies um, context, uh, uh, 
perspectives from sociology, anthropology, history of technology, and science and technology studies, which he, he talks about at some length, in particular uh, that branch of it uh, we know as actor network theory, uh, which he, he notes provides a corrective to single author notions, uh, corrective to the auteur model. Uh, in Fallon's account, actor network theory posits a network to highlight the relational aspects of things and defines a network in Latour's words as the trace left behind by some moving agent. So actor network theory frees design history from the need to evaluate designers, movements, styles, or new technologies against some ahistorical matrix of good, bad. It also returns to the practice of assembling evidence. And, and coming from journalism, I'm particularly interested in that. Uh, um, and assembling that evidence in, in networks. Uh, alliances might then be struck with other metaphors than the network, such as webs or polyhedrons of causality, which is uh, Foucault's phrase. Uh, they're all nonlinear models that has, uh, emerged from um, uh, various places, but Tim Engold, the anthropologist, uh, embraces webs versus networks. Foucault, as I say, um, polyhedrons of causality. So my background, uh, trade news reporter on design in London, moving to New York, working for ID and various things, and then sort of, sort of being dragged into uh, academia. Um, no, uh, leaping for it, let's say. Uh, so that, that background, anyway, has, has provide, provided an archive uh, which in sort of current sort of high degree research I've been able, to, I've had the luxury of reflecting on um, under Tony Fry's supervision. Um, uh, so I've been reflecting on this, uh, this, this journalistic work and in, in this attempt to build a case for a more relational or rhizomatic uh, approach. Uh, journalism is, after all, the first draft of history. Uh, that's coming from Calcutt and Hammond's book. Um, in 2011, but uh, as a fairly well-known concept. Um, and journalistic processes, I think, play at least a part in, in rethinking design history. And one simple example I've considered, uh, reconsidered recently, is the Clearview typeface uh, shown here. I reported on this uh, in 1999, and it's, uh, as you probably know, currently being implemented across road signs uh, in the country. Clearview is, is quite poorly represented if we take a Pevsnerian or art history of design approach to its discussion. We might uh, try and summarize the typeface in terms of a larger narrative on late modern revivals or the persistence of a functionalist faith in uniform systems built around sans serif letter forms. We might seek to lionize the typefaces designers, Don Meeker and James Montalbano, uh, celebrities of the future. Uh, but this would all miss the point that Clearview is not the product of one author, or of even two authors, uh, nor is it adequately understood in terms of a history of visual forms. A relational history, then, by contrast, would, uh, like I tried in uh, 1999, develop a map of the actors assembled around an, uh, the new highway font, beginning um, by interviewing the design and research team behind it, by feeding off the controversy, as Latour put it, uh, the reporter and the relational historian would begin to build a picture of interdisciplinary research, mapping, for example, uh, the problem of a highway system conceived as a user interface riddled with inconsistencies, or uh, and the material properties of reflective metal signs under the harsh glare of quartz halogen headlights. That was a key impetus in getting this, this sign, uh, this, this typeface redesigned. Uh, also, standard, uh, shifting standards of what constitutes legibility amid an aging population with deteriorating eyesight. I mean, this is, uh, just to sort of restate that, this is what happened. As we get, get older and our eyes get worse, and the signs get more and more reflective, and the headlights get more powerful, there's much more blurring of the, uh, the letters. And so um, Montalbano and Mika attempted to introduce this new typeface. But that's not it. I mean, that's, that would just be a very horribly reductive narrative. There's so much more uh, if you just keep expanding or mapping out. There's the conflicting philosophies on the effects of highway signs on psychological perceptions of safety. 
uh, the impact of weather on legibility and safety, the contested boundaries between state and federal jurisdiction on highway management. Uh, so to reveal the interdisciplinary complexity of a seemingly simple typeface project is, begin, is to begin to establish a mapping of design's relations with laws and customs. We begin to see how the non-human agency of, of Clearview embodies and perpetuates a way of being. That something as seemingly neutral as a, as a highway sign embodies an entire history of theories turned decisions turned policies from how people should drive to who should drive uh, and what age they should be to the very idea that people should drive. I mean, you could argue uh, that, that the, um, you know, the highway system is, is part of a whole system encouraging us to, to keep on driving. And so in this sense, a, uh, a mapping-based uh, relational uh, history is aligned with Tony Fry's defuturing philosophy, which seeks to disclose the bias and direction, as he puts it, of that which is designed and how it is totally implicated in the world we conceptually <coughs> constitute, materially produce, waste, occupy, and use, end quote. Perhaps unsurprising, then, that the exemplars of uh, such an approach um, mostly come from outside of sanctified design history, uh, a case in point being the sociologist Elizabeth Shove, whose work explores the relation between designed artifacts, social practices, and arrangements and social, technological, uh, social technical systems. Her account of air conditioning is particularly good. It commences with the point that comfort is an historical and, he and cultural construct that has been increasingly globalized at no small environmental cost. The decline of the siesta as a means of adapting to temperature, the disappearance of 19th century um, French peasant practices, such as uh, gathering in winter with neighboring families in the biggest and warmest cowshed, only returning home to sleep at night, all serve in Chauve's narrative to, to provide vivid, vivid jolts to remind that the privatized comfort of the air-conditioned interior has, uh, while appearing to innocently service a need, dramatically shifted human practices and sensibilities. So there we have it. There's agency in, in a non-human thing, the thing being the air-conditioning system. And, uh, and she, uh, or there's, we build a relational map of the emergence of thermally controllable environments and identify after show the central role of one particular code of the ASHRAE standard, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE. <laughs> um, and the, the role that that thing, that standard, played in naturalizing and globalizing a particular notion of thermal comfort, i.e. between 60 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. One effect of, of, of such a relational map would be to clarify that modern concepts of comfort, while appearing to be natural human needs met by technological advances, can be traced to an 18th century invention of the idea of comfort as a physical condition that people have a right to expect. A couple of points in comparison from normative design history are useful here. Though, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to consign Rainer Bannum to normative, uh, but um, his, his architecture of the well-tempered environment seems uh, relevant in that it's astutely noted the neglect of mechanical environmental controls in architectural history, but he did it from a formal perspective. So if you like, under the shadow of Pevsner, uh, in terms of how um, uh, controls, mechanical controls had manifested themselves in the form of the buildings or the forms of the buildings. And this provided a convenient way uh, for Bannum to appease normative design history by lionizing, for example, the Larkin building as a forerunner of the uh, Georges Pompidou because it housed serviced installations in its, in its corner towers. Uh, like its precursor, Seaford Gideon's Mechanization Takes Command, Bannum's book uh, continued a functionalist project in which fixed human needs, once again they were, they were fixed, comfort, were increasingly met by technological advancement. Um, and by contrast, Elizabeth Shove's book begins with the critical position that our vantage point of having achieved in the present um, maximum technological advancement has blinded us to the bias and direction of that so-called advancement. 
with the advance of air conditioning came the decline of cultural practices to adapt to hot summer nights. We withdrew from larger social networks on verandas or in, in, in cow sheds in winter into privatized living rooms. And at this point, I think uh, Latour and uh, Cereza's suggestion that we need to question this hubris of the present and consider the idea that the past is no longer out of date provides a helpful framework. Uh, much as uh, Cereza maps the present-day automobile as a disparate aggregate of scientific and technical, technical solutions dating from different periods, so there's uh, Carnot's cycle, uh, a Neolithic wheel, and a Model T... Uh, <laughs> Um, so we might map the socio-technical hybrid of solutions that have brought us uh, the refrigerated uh, modernist cube of, of typical of uh, a contemporary uh, sun-baked waterfronts and deserts. Uh, Trevor Pinch and Viva Biker uh, show in their history of the bicycle that technologies proceed through a process of variation and selection resulting in stabilization of particular variants uh, that then we tend to revisit and cast or distort as inevitable, logical, or essential. Uh, stabilization is a process that comes through the convergence of social and technical interests. A Darwinian model uh, might place the smaller wheels and pulled back saddle of the, uh, of the um, bicycle down at the bottom there, Lawson's bicyclette, um, as a pivotal turning point. But in fact, uh, it was that particular bike was a commercial failure, and these other ones were much more uh, successful at the time. And Biker and Pinch, um, I love that the Biker is the creation of this great bike history, but um, it was meant to be. Uh, they make a, a case for a non-linear, multi-directional model of technological development, uh, as opposed to this sort of linear Darwinian model. Uh, there were conflicting technical solutions for different social groups, they argue. For example, well, actually they show, and it's, it's a pretty convincing evidence-based argument, um, the social group of cyclists riding the high-wheeled penny farthing, or the ordinary as it was known, um, were, quote, young men of means and nerve who used it for sport. Uh, but that bike was not deemed appropriate for women. Um, well, in fact, no bikes at the time were uh, appro deemed appropriate for women because they had to mount them, shock horror. Uh, and the only uh, time it was allowed uh, was as a means of getting to church. And, um, but given the demand, <laughs> the demand for bikes, um, and anticipation among producers that there might be a market there, um, uh, high wheel safeties were adapted for women. And you get these strange um, products like this one. She, she can't actually uh, sit on the saddle. She has to stand on the side there. And um, clearly, as, as Biker and Pinch put it, there's some uh, athletic problems with this, uh, this one. <laughs> Uh, so so um, uh, then you have sort of developments like air-filled tires, uh, which were um, considered you know, laughable when they first came out um, and unsafe due to uh, side-slipping. And they were introduced to reduce the vibration on the smaller-wheeled uh, vehicles like the, the one below. Um, but uh, they, they thought, it was thought they caused side-slipping side, side and... Uh, um, but when they were shown, demonstrated at a racetrack, then the uh, athletic young men of means and nerve uh, stopped derisively laughing, and there was a shift. Um, so what the multi-directional model does is it incorporates all these uh, multiplicitous social factors and refuses to see certain important developments as amusing aberrations, refuses to make this one singular line of, of progress. And similarly, our cognitive maps of time are in need of reconsideration, showing the passage of time is inextricably entangled with an enlightenment view uh, of the marching, relentless, sequential line of time. Uh, Rosenberg and Grafton, in their book, Cartographies of Time, trace a visible, visible allegiance between Christian rationalist views of time and linear representations. They focus on works by Joseph Priestley, shown here, uh, cited as an 18th century innovator in the linear timeline. Uh, he suggested that, that himself that the timeline was a fantasized visual referent for an object without material substance. 
and it appears uh, to guarantee directionality to a past and future history. Henry Bergson, the philosopher, referred to this imaginary homogenous time marching always forward as a deceiving idol. And as Johanna Drucker put it, the contemporary representation of time is as, as something unidirectional, homogenous, continuous, with no breaks or ruptures, when none of those things are true in humanistic experience. Once we dispense with that, I, I, I think we're kind of liberated in a way, and we can begin to question the whole premise of design history as a progress of technological innovation styled or dressed to make palatable uh, uh, um, uh, and consumable um, things. We might contrast this premise with that of the uh, German philosopher Peter Sloderdijk. Sloderdijk has argued that the 20th century introduced into the history of civilization three criteria. One, the practice of terrorism. Two, the concept of product design. And three, environmental thinking. With the first, he writes, terrorism, enemy interaction was established on a post-militaristic basis. I'll come back to that in a minute. With the second, product design, functionalism was enabled to reconnect to the world of perception. And with the third, environmental thinking, phenomena of life and knowledge became more profoundly linked than ever before." End quote. So uh, let's just sort of uh, vivify this account, which he does so uh, fantastically in his book, Terror from the Air, uh, with the spectacular, uh, for want of a better word, arrival um, of the 20th century in terms of these reference points uh, in chemical warfare, specifically April 22nd, 1915 in Ypres, when a specially formed German gas regiment launched an attack um, on French-Canadian troops using chlorine gas cylinders. So amid the monstrous yellowish smoke clouds that sent soldiers staggering from the trenches, discarding their weapons, spitting blood, tearing off their tunics, and pleading for water, the 20th century was transformed into an age in which the target was no longer the body, but the enemy's environment. And that's what he means by uh, the shift um, that he talked about uh, here. Um, from uh, to sort of the post-militaristic shift. So you're targeting environments rather than individuals. You're shifting warfare from a sort of sport of good marksmanship to something altogether different. Um, and this, as he argues, became the basic plea of terrorism, uh, the shift in which the body was a target to the environment being the target. On reflection, uh, this design innovation, um, chlorine gas cylinders, if you like, and Sloderdijk's three criteria of the 20th century cast a stark light on every work of design brought into the 20th century. From the air-conditioned home to the automobile, product design can be viewed as a means of improving one person's environment or sphere while poisoning another's. That's, again, uh, Sloderdijk's point. This directly affects the groundwork and framing of design history, as another example from my journalistic back catalog will uh, hopefully illustrate it. So I was invited to write about a new piece of product design. I mean, this is the thing about uh, journalism. You don't get to reflect in the critical light when you're in the moment. And uh, this has been the pleasure of being able to revisit some of it. Uh, so this was a new piece of design and technology aimed at improving indoor air quality amid the legions of respiratory problems that have com accompanied construction of the modern environment. So I set about, at the time, constructing what I thought would be a comprehensive relational mapping of the product's development. Um, it was an air purifier. The challenge of designing the air so that uh, workers might sit themselves next to a purifier that cleaned only the zone around them uh, seemed particularly poignant to me at the time, uh, speaking of a kind of design history that positioned innovation as a sort of fix or a band-aid to larger problems. Uh, and, but it's not, you know, it's uh, not to be sniffed at, um, cleaning the air. <laughs> uh, in addition to the um, uh, pollutants commonly found in indoor air, dust, mold, asbestos, pollen, chalk, and smoke, is a new generation of EPA unregulated nanoparticles which have been associated with cardiovascular problems. 
And since to clean the air of even one room is an energy inefficient undertaking, constantly compromised by the fact that no room is sealed and people bring in dirty air every time they open a door, zone-based approaches such as this one have emerged. Uh, the personal air purifier that I was looking into was even called the zone and certainly was being positioned for a slot in the first draft of a normative uh, design history, albeit uh, perhaps a fairly minor role. In its early prototype stages shown here, uh, the product was considered innovative enough to warrant selection by the curators of the Museum of Modern Arts exhibition on future technologies uh, design in the elastic mind. But uh, in hindsight, uh, the parallels with the design of toxic cloud weaponology in World War I are worth pressing home to see how a history that didn't premise technological progress might be a bit more informative. In the 20th century, as Sloterdijk notes, it became possible to poison someone else's environment, to make the breather an accomplice in his own demise or annihilation. The, as he puts it rather darkly, the breather has to, has to breathe, so has to breathe in the, 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 the weapon. Uh, defense against such weapons came in the form of gas masks, which are the first step towards the principle of air conditioning, as Sloterdijk puts it. Disconnecting, quote, a defined volume of space from the surrounding air. Now, the intensive research conducted by the makers and designers of the desktop purifier I was investigating established that design, de designing a defined volume of air cannot but impact the rest of the atmosphere. So aside from the environmental impact of manufacturing consumer goods with polymers, paints, and precious metals uh, to improve someone's but not everyone's air, purifiers have a more immediate impact on the surrounding environment. Current systems use one of two technologies, the high efficiency particulate air, or HEPA technology, and the other one is electrostatic precipitation, ESP. Uh, HEPA systems force air through tightly woven filters that trap particles, and this method brings noise pollution uh, due to the drop in pressure, pressure caused by blowing air through a dense surface. ESP systems, the electrostatic precipitation method, they first charge the air in a corona field, which is high voltage, low current, before trapping the charged particles in some sort of conductive filter. And this method proved highly popular because it was quiet, it was silent. And sales of this uh, particular product, not the one I was writing about, a precursor called, uh, it was made by Sharper Image, image um, uh, were, were very high and then they plummeted because it became plagued by controversy uh, because in that process of charging and then trapping air, ozone gas is produced as a byproduct. And ozone, as we know, is useful in the upper atmosphere of the Earth for protecting us from ultraviolet light, but at ground level, it's an irritant known to damage our respiratory systems and those of animals. So to summarize a relational impact map, you cannot clean one person's private air without poisoning another's. Uh, this little detour into engineering and biology, I think, serves to illustrate how a relational history cannot ignore uh, this kind of information in its account of product innovation. Indeed, um, the designers of this particular air purifier and its long development process wrestled extensively uh, with the noise ozone problem. The form of the thing shifting dramatically as its inventor attempted to produce an ESP-based purifier that didn't produce traceable amounts of ozone gas. A normative design history would, as did the Museum of Modern Art in Design in the Elastic Mind, uh, base its selection on the object's form and correspondence to a zeitgeist, uh, defined in the MoMA instance as the momentous advances in technology, science, and social mores that have characterized the last quarter century. Now, this approach, uh, the MoMA approach, has been re repeatedly criticized for perpetuating, as one critic succ succinctly put it, um, this is Claire Cogdor, a populist machine age modernist mold, one built upon strong faith in technological determinism and the technofix as keys to social and evolutionary progress. Uh, it's clearly quite difficult to extract curatorship and by extension design history writing from this machine age modernist legacy. I've tried to argue that elsewhere. 
um, in the paper actually that Clive kindly quoted at the beginning, um, where I um, position Philip Johnson's 1934 Machine Age exhibition at MoMA as, as pretty uh, significant. The problem comes back to our conceptualization of time again. Only by following controversy through extensive discussion with its designers and inventor, this is back to the air purifier, did it become possible to move that thing off its pedestal or desktop, frozen in time as a futuristic form, as it sort of appeared in the MoMA show, and see it as the coming together of material, social, and technological controversies. And that's just to pick up on a point Susan raised earlier, where I'd be very interested in the agency of things, uh, sort of seeing the agency of things as not something that's fixed, like a thing doesn't have an agency, but there are controversies happening within all things, and they, they, don't, they don't stop. Uh, because, you know, things are positioned in time, which is always changing, and context, which is always changing. So only by situating that air purifier in light of World War I and, and Sloterdijk's toxicology does it become possible to see personal air, like the personal car and the personally conditioned, air-conditioned living room, in a larger relational map of effects. In short, the thing, the object, needs to be resituated in time. As, as Cameron Tonkinwise has argued, our overemphasis of product permanence has meant that things are ignored and go through our households as quickly as possible. An ancient sense of product impermanence means, as he puts it, spending time with things, maintaining and repairing them. Uh, remember, repair of household objects. Tonkin Wise exhorts us to design things that are not finished, that can keep on, by keeping on, being repaired and altered, things in motion, as he puts it. Uh, Rosenberg and Grafton, in that Cartographies of Time book, introduced some alternative models of visualizing temporal flow, such as the map of narrative digressions in Lawrence Stern's Life and Times of Tristan Shandy, Gentlemen, and the branching time map in Charles Renouvier's diagram from Uchronia. Um, and uh, I think this is uh, also a way of... Um, uh, looking at the, a sort of an unpacking or explicating, as uh, uh, Cires puts it, of, of the past, um, an unfolding, explicate, explique, the French word to fold, to unfold. So what I'm advocating here is history writing as a relational way of mapping not permanent landmarks but things in motion. A useful way of achieving this as Tonkin Wise also implies, is by looking at things that are literally not finished, like the air purifier when I encountered it in prototype form. Um, Mikhail Cerez has termed such unfinished things as quasi-objects. And uh, with Latour established an entire method uh, based on studying science in action um, as opposed to ready-made science or technology. Uh, as Latour put it in that book, uh, Science in Action, we either arrive before the facts and machines are black boxed or we follow the controversies that reopen them. And both Latour and Cerez have expounded on the space shuttle disasters, two of them, as examples of how black boxed objects, the shiny space shuttles racing to the stars, become quasi objects when they fail. Uh, and, uh, and they sort of expose their consti constitutive interests and translations, and translations being the actor network theory and term for the conversion of social interests and arguments into incontrovertible uh, technological form. So um, uh, the explosion of the Challenger in 1986 uh, that killed all seven crew members, uh, Sarah's controversially aligns with the sacrifices of children to Baal in Carthage. Um, although we prefer to think of Challenger as an object of the world, it is simultaneously an object of society, one which transforms our rapport with things and our relations among us ourselves. Uh, and in Carthage, children were reportedly lifted up onto the arms of a giant statue of, statue of Baal, where they were roasted to death. Uh, the Challenger, argues Ceres, allowed us to assuage our unslakable thirst for human sacrifice to the gods. Uh, whom we think we have forgotten. Uh, and Latour uses this picture of the Columbia crash, inv crash investigation to sort of show a kind of a relational mapping, how the thing reveals its constituent interests only when it's failed. 
closing example then is a relational map that we made when I was at the University of Texas at Austin uh, design department uh, looking at Pruitt Igo, the post-war St. Louis public housing project that was demolished in 1972. Uh, the photograph and footage of that demolition became the poster child of what Charles Jenks called the end of modernism. And the reductive pat account of its failure is entrenched in design history that it represents, and that word I use with emphasis, a Pevsnerian emphasis, uh, the failure of the Corbusian dream that everyone should be housed in a rationalized city of machine-like structures with leisure work and residential zones. Uh, in fact, as Catherine Bristol, the architectural historian, has shown, there were many social and economic factors at play in pruitt Igo's demise, of which architectural design was probably the least important. Systemic failure to adequately support public housing meant impossible budgets, budgets and chronic cost cutting imposed by the St. Louis Housing Authority. Uh, the architects were only guilty of being relatively novice, pushovers, if you like. They agreed to revise their original mixed-use, mixed-height plan for the high-density scheme and accommodated budgeting measures that eliminated amenities, such as play areas, landscaping, and ground floor bathrooms, and then value engineered the points of contact between tenants and living units. Uh, there were poor quality doorknobs and locks that broke, inadequate frames that allowed the wind to blow out the windows. Falling occupancy was a significant factor in its demise as tenants found inexpensive private dwellings and moved out of the isolated high rises. St. Louis officials had failed to anticipate that their project was conceived when demand for high income housing, low income housing units uh, in the inner city was at a record high due to dislocation caused by, and here's another interesting factor in that relational map, federal sponsored, federally sponsored slum clearance, this is post war, and the highway program. So as people being sort of shifted out of buildings, they, they became this huge demand for the sort of projects. Um, and at the same time, a cutting of funding. And as occupancy rates fell at Pruitt Igo, as people found other places to live, um, and because of the market changed, vandalism and crime grew, and the housing authority had less rent to maintain the buildings. And there was a nine month rent strike by tenants in 1969 that effectively put the nail in the coffin. Uh, Bristol concludes that Pruitt Igo was simplified as an architectural failure by Jenks and Co to make architecture seem important. So I've tried to argue here for a relational design history that moves beyond the paradigms of the art history of design established in the 20th century. And this is an argument not, uh, I've, I hope I've shown, uh, based on uh, my own uh, opinions, um, but also on uh, vigorous, if sporadic, conversation, uh, uh, discussion about the limits of normative design history in academia. Um, as the design historian John Walker asked, why are design historians so unimaginative? Walker characterized the dominant view of design history as follows. Among contemporary design historians, the dominant definition is the modern one, he wrote. Design as a specialist activity associated with the industrial revolution, mass production, manufacture, the modern movement in architecture and the consumer society. But if history is about the highlights of design, how can that represent all of design? As Walker put it, you can't learn about a mountain range by studying the peaks. More fundamentally, who decides what the peaks are and on what basis? If we take a longer, more expansive view of design, uh, then design history becomes a history of tool making, of imposing meaningful order, of a primordial human act that has shaped the way humans have evolved. And at the same time, this history of designing has come to haunt us in the present because what we've made and how we've made it has started to affect dramatically the environment in which and out of which we've made it. As Tony Fry has written, oh wait, I've got to bring him up here. That's my one trick to wake up students. I thought I'd use it on you. Uh, we've arrived at a moment wherein all that humanity attempts to regulate is at odds with, what the world, with the world that actually regulates us. In short, we need to rethink design history because design in its larger di definition is the act that has led us to the current crisis uh, that needs to be reimagined. Uh, to bring about a future. I don't think we do this. I don't think we reimagine history uh, by sweeping out the dominant or wrong history. 
Uh, but as Susan uh, suggests, or suggested in her uh, provocations uh, that, uh, that she sent out to, um, to me at least in advance of this event, uh, by amplifying moments, or as I'd argue, by situating them in larger relational networks and then looking at their legacies. So um, to summarize uh, one more time in a different way, it seems that there's a widespread impulse to escape the Pevsnerian shadow on design history. I think we can acknowledge that and that I uh, perhaps use the whipping boy a little redundantly um, and show design in all its uh, complexity and potency. Uh, in their book, um, Drucker and McVarish argue that by definition, any seamless linear history is false, concealing the multiple layers of disjunction and tension at work in a culture. And last but not least, um, as many historians and critics agree, a discipline will die if its history doesn't grow. And Marie uh, Willis wrote that in a recent issue of um, Design and Culture. Uh, Crouch here puts it helpfully that history undergoes constant and continual revision by all cultures. And history, I'd argue, is undergoing dramatic revision at the moment because we have come to the end of modernity, the end of the ideas of progress measured in terms of humans' mastery over nature. We revise history by questioning the concepts, stories, assumptions, and perspectives that put those stories into black boxes, made them unchallenged truths. And this is a matter of finding in the past a means with which to shape the future. Thank you. Modernity is in some way a period in which we make things and somehow think that things don't really have effects, either environmental effects, effects on us, effects. Uh, that they're somehow just there. And, and uh, in that, in a certain sense, profound sense, inconsequential. Now, I think what we're actually now understanding at this point is that things are extremely consequential and that therefore the thinking of things. The other reason that I may be very sympathetic to the idea of thinking the think, you know, how things work, is actually to try to think the truth of things. Now, this may seem a, a curious thing to say, when at the same time the thrust of Peter's work in some way, the thrust of the kind of thing in in a different way, the thrust of the kind of things I'm interested in is also to say that things are not really facts. They're not really, in a certain sense, there at all, but are only, in fact, really propositions. That we actually have one of our bad tendencies to dealing with the world is that we give it to the main world, is that we give it too much uh, factual uh, uh, authority. And that what we now can perhaps begin to understand is that things are really only ever propositions about what things can be. And therefore, to some extent, the recovery of the truth of things is to some extent the recovery of that prop propositional quality. And therefore, that leads us into where designing is. Now here, I think we're in a really very difficult um, arena where uh, the, the, there is a tendency to talk about the world as a designed entity. I sort of want to racket that term design when it's used in that way to 
and certainly want to talk about the world as a main entity. And I want to preserve a moment which is where design, ideally at least, is the moment of self-reflection on making, the moment where one stands back and actually thinks about this making. This is at the point at which, in fact, the facticity of the world is put into, or the main world, is put into question, and we actually think about things in terms of, um, of how it is. And the truth, then, of things is both a recovery of their relational truth for human beings, which I think is, and the truth of things is also the truth of our capacity at once to make things and our dependency as human beings upon made things. Those are the two truths that I would want to kind of recover out of this, which I don't think we can operate uh, with, with that out there. So this puts a nice complex spin <laughs> onto what Peter did. But, uh, I have a question for both of you. So maybe you could still be on stage because I'm sure people will want to. You know, you, we, we, the assertion that things are always propositions. I wonder how, I mean, maybe because I just went to a memorial service last weekend and I've got death on the brain, but it also it occurs to me that things, at least at one point, were our ways to defeat death. That they were, in fact, memorials to ourselves. And that they were, in fact, in another era at any rate, kind of closed systems in that. And that, that accounts for some of our blindness, that there was such ego invested in or such transference, because we know we're mortal. But now that we know we're truly mortal, that we can blow ourselves up in the planets, is there a shift in our attitude towards mortality here, underneath this idea that design is merely propositional, that, that you know, this perpetual uncertainty. One could argue that one makes things, uh, certainly not air conditioners, but uh, I'm trying to think of another example, a building. One designs a building, and with the idea that it is, yes, it may in New York City come down in 70 years, but in general, the idea that it is somehow summative as opposed to forward looking. Do you see the difference I'm getting at? You're pushing forward, and I'm thinking of another, an idea of making as somehow summative. Um, the, that's interesting because buildings. Um, so the history of buildings is such uh, so enwrapped with the uh, um, memorials and um, uh, so also you know again the kind of desire to frame them in terms of an art history that looks at that was that building and that signified this and uh, that's why I like um, I think Latour and Alberto your neighbor come up with this phrase uh, or, uh, give me a gun and I will make buildings move. And they, the gun they propose is the, the sort of cinema, so that you would actually uh, film buildings over a period of time, so that you stop seeing them in a history where they're just fixed points that are memorials, and see them as things that are constantly moving. No, I'm not saying we have to see them that way, but that's why they are made, the impetus to yeah, make. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think... Um, that's got to be one motivation, right, of why we keep adding things to the world. Right. And also, the, sort of the fact that the world that we've made wants us to keep adding things to it, that the, the systems have been put in place that are very hard to stop. A moment of, that might support in some way, Susan, what you were saying, is the way I, way I observe part of some work I've been doing. The way that, to some extent, monuments are gradually losing their materiality. Um, you know, we think of the the statue uh, as the classic uh, memorial. You, you could argue that Rodin's um, Balzac was the last great statue, and since then there hasn't been a statue. And that last, the memorials which are couched in the form of statue. Mm -hmm. Think of the statue part of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, see, it seems absurd, or the World War II m m Memorial seems absurd. What is not absurd is the Vietnam Veterans Wall, but it's almost a dissolution of the monument. Um, mo many people find many of the larger Holocaust monuments almost obscene in their monumentality, whereas the tiny gestures that are sometimes made, these stumble stones, 
these are the kind of gestures which now actually speak to us about death. So that paradoxically we don't, perhaps we are to some extent even losing the necessity for, if you like, Stonehenge, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Perhaps we are kind of evolving past that necessity to a different kind of understanding of our own finite uh, existence, perhaps even an awareness of a different kind of awareness of fragility, which is also perhaps part of gradually coming to comprehend the responsibility for that which we have made, which is very large and very difficult to get hold of. Mostly because most of us don't feel as if we made the world we have made. Who wants to take responsibility for <coughs> the, the you know, lecture theatre 407 here? <laughs> <laughs> but they did this. Maybe somebody in the audience who actually did it. You know, but nobody, we don't. They, we tend to feel about the world, I will not take responsibility for this. This was not mine. And yet, to some extent, we are now enmeshed in a world where we have no choice right. but begin to take on this one. And therefore, the design act is then the act of uh, reflecting on this. Now, what we also need into this equation somewhere with between the word design, which is so much of, often of an abstraction over here and things over here, is I think the notion of the way uh, things are configured to act in various ways and the way that we can act upon things by reconfiguring things. I mean, which is to say, again, I think what it is that design so in the self-conscious mode can do with respect to, to things. So in fact, the, the re-tuning of our relation with things and, and of things to environments through how we reconfigure say, things sometimes in very tiny gestures that nonetheless set things going in a different way. And that, if you think about it, will have to be what the shift from unsustainment to sustainment is. 98% of the made world will continue to exist. The only way we could have a sustainable world on the basis of an, if you like, an unsustainable infrastructure is by how we can reattune unsustainable infrastructure to become sustainable. Whatever we mean by that in the end, that's not, you know, that's it, that itself. But that will, that's the requirement upon us to actually realize that potential from out of what is. So I think the, where we can see there is a, still a kind of utopic moment to the design act is not in the kind of like formal perfection, but it is this possibility of the reconfigurative gesture that sets something working in a different way and does so, to come back to my point and to the sentence from Peter that I started with, because when we are designing, I think that there is far more thought in that. that beginning to understand how much designs embody thought, certainly ont and ontology, always, always a view, every design configuration, every object, having a view of persons and the relation of persons and world and things in it, and then for comprehending that again, the design act is actually trying to take that on board, and again, trying to think how we can achieve just a quick uh, response, uh, just to, uh, just like those two examples, the Vietnam Memorial and Stonehenge, uh, seen as reconfigurative gestures, um, or seen in terms of that, and the, 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 what makes the Vietnam Memorial, uh, Mylene's work, work perhaps and persist and not be a fixed memorial is that it is engaged in a sort of social act, right? There is a sort of interaction where you you go there and you participate, you look up um, people and uh, you know, it's a sort of a site of a kind of a ritual of um, making rubbings and finding names. And um, uh, curiously, Stonehenge is also the site of a ritual, um, but uh, the conflict there seems to be that, that conflict between the desire to memorialize the memorial by putting, you know, uh, fences around it, and then those who are seeking to reactivate or reconfigure uh, Stonehenge by making it a site of ritual again, as in the sort of solstice types um, who turn up there. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the idea that uh, you can uh, make, build, buildings can come alive through uh, reconfiguring the way we see them. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, <coughs> come 
down from the ideal for a moment uh, with a comment. First of all, thank you for a very ambitious uh, talk. It was really wide ranging and interesting. Um, I want to come from the side of history for a moment and point out what I think anyway is a difference between journalism and theory when you come to history. And that is when we teach history, whether it's art history, which I do, and design history, which I do, we, um, we talk about objects and ideas that have succeeded. We talk about what we have, what evidence exists now, whether uh, of, a, of a past or of a recent present. And the, to perhaps add to that rhizomic model, um, issues of economic value come into play why does something succeed um, that comes into history in the moment of social um, mores of needs as well as promotion, advertising, desire, uh, want, and again, need. Um, those, I think, have to be brought into an equation in talking about history as well as we, I think we come back to that individual when we're talking about, you said, really the intention um, in the comments just now. Um, that is it brings us back to the individual where we run the risk of creating a canon. And that's it for now. <laughs> I don't mind the idea of the going back to the individual. I'm interested in looking how individuals negotiate circumstances, how they grasp the situation in which they place both in the relations and forces in that situation uh, and in the potential in that si situation, how they negotiate it sometimes to make a new kind of originary thing. I think that's an extremely interesting process. The bit about the real bit that I have a problem with is this notion that we deal with design successes. And yes, I do a lot. The things which I am prepared to go on stage and say, I think this is a success. The point is, I think one of design's huge problems is we have no idea why they're successful. There are famous saying in advertising, 50% of advertising works if only we knew which 50%. Uh, that used to be the old advertising slogan. So I don't, I think we're unbelievably bad at articulate, being able to comprehend why when, when we intuit that X works, it's the dimensions of its working. We're not good at it. And therefore that's why I say in a fundamental way, it's why Peter's first initial point was so important. We really don't know what the things are we make. We're better at making than understanding what we're making. And the reason for that is that actually making is an unbelievably complex synthetic activity. You know, it used to be thought, it is still very often thought by people from you know, social sciences, literature, humanities, and technology that because designs look simple, they must be simple. Somebody once said to me, Clive, you let me get this right. He was an engineer. <laughs> All right. um, you, sp you spent four years training somebody to design a postage stamp with an implication that really it should take about four weeks. But of course, actually, there is complexity within that achieved simplicity. Disinterring it, comprehending it, and actually being able to comprehend especially I think the way that design configurations deal with and to a degree but never finally reconcile incommensurable demands and requirements <coughs> that is all part of the understanding of how it is that what it is that things are and, and this is where the, 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 the sort of the mental complexity of the design act lies and just to be provocative for what I'll kind of push against Chris, where I think compared to that, my answer to reverse the idea of the postage that the big engineering by comparison is just one dimension. 
<laughs> so I, I, I can't but pass up this opportunity, but it, I, I'm not going to respond to that exactly. I'm curious what the relation, I'm missing the individual that interacts with whatever the maker has done. And I think this idea that you brought up, uh, the Vietnam Memorial and people taking rubbings and that thing, wasn't perhaps in the mind of the designer, but it's it's with, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from ignorance on that one, but but it's the it's people's relationship to it that maybe pushes that reconfiguration. So so the I think as a maker is sometimes you can envision how you would respond to it, but that's the individual you. I think if we step back from that in that act of making, I think that if we take a sort of existential view of making and say that a thing is made in order to have reciprocal co consequences, so one makes a coat in order to be warm, then that, the, the reciprocity, the relation of projection and reciprocity is built into the making act in the first place. Now, one of the difficulties I think of you know, industrial production and so on is the, the gradual distancing between making and user, so that these become an almost infinite series of steps by which and there's a, there's a sort of truncation made, advertising, branding, marketing, and so on, helps to sort of make an artificial re relationship with them. But I think the fundamental act of making is a reciprocal act. And actually, but, and, and the, the making, the making is actually the making of that reciprocal act, not the thing itself. So this is actually also pulling back from the thing itself. It's not actually to lessen the thing itself, but it is to actually see that the the truth of the thing is not just in the thing as an autonomous object. That's actually maybe a one. So, uh, is it possible to go back to the slide with Tony Fry on the presentation? Because I just had it. I, kind of, I don't remember it literally. Sorry. But I had a question. Because this might take a couple of seconds. <laughs> 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 you know, hold my question until after the next one. Okay, maybe we'll go to the there's a question at the back there. Yeah, Peter, this is a question about the historiographic method in the presentation we saw. And I really like the notion of a critique of normative design history, but I also like the notion of critiquing any normative history in this sense. And I think Latour is a super actor in this work. And I'd like you to maybe reverse super a super actor. I'd like you to reverse your critique to Latour's work. So when when I go to shot and all of us humanists are showing up at SHOT these days, people from cultural studies, visual culture, material culture, they've been there, they've done that. I often feel that design studies, cultural studies, and other places have only recently discovered a lot of after network theory, Scott, what have you. So what I'm really curious to see is that we've got all these theories of arrays of objects, assemblies, networks, circuits, and I can quickly just mention, say, Victor Margolin's design uh, product cycle notion, Hedridge's work on the Italian motor scooter where he talks about interlocking frames and moments in the whole process of production, design, distribution, usage. Harvey Motlick's notion of stuff systems. We've got all of these types of models. But what I'd really like to see is what happens to those methods and models and paradigms when you plug it into the objects you're looking at. So how can you reverse this critique through historiography back to actor network theory? So what happens to actor network theory when you're mapping it onto these types of objects. Can you take that criticism back to those types of theories? Otherwise, I feel we're in danger of this application. So how can you do kind of a meta critique of these models that your objects can maybe force you to do? So, so that would be the question. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. I think the tour has struggled with that, but that sort of, uh, or at least resisted attempts to sort of canonize or solidify or fossilize actor network theory as a method. In that, you know, they sort of famously says this, and like three things wrong with it, the, the actor, the network, the yeah. theory, yeah. And the hyphen as well. And the hyphen between yeah. the two, that's right. Uh, um, that's a really nice challenge, that then you would apply actor network theory 
as a way of understanding the rise of axiomatic theory. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Well, I'm just curious. I mean, I think Latour gets off kind of scot-free. Yes. There's lots of problems and critiques that are made about actor network theory. So I'm just wondering, you know, he doesn't plug his model and method. Neither does, neither does Michael Callan or John Law or others. I mean, they're coming out of management studies. They're coming out of history of science. Let's say when we bring it into design history or visual culture or material culture, all of these other fields, I'm curious, well, what archives, what methods, what problematics, what discourse, what have you, what can we bring back to actor network theory? How can we change it? Are we just too reliant upon this model, too seduced by it? Perhaps? Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I think we are seduced by it. And I think um, uh, it's important to move on. I think one really important area is this problem of um, power. Uh, you know, the how, how does it represent interests of power? And if you compare it to sort of Foucault's approach, you get a completely different uh, sure. paradigm. And um, the only way I could resolve that in my head is to think that perhaps uh, actor network theory provides an account of um, how power plays happen and might mm -hmm. repeatedly happen over time. But it still doesn't quite um, capture. I think the other problem with actor network theory is it tends to, I know this is a common critique, right, that it's yeah. uh, somehow amoral. Yes. It, uh, yeah. you know, it doesn't yeah. give us a ground in compass. And I do think that's why Latour's book, We Have Never Been Modern, has been quite useful. Uh, signal of a shift in his thinking toward where that little method sits in a larger scheme of, of things. And I think that his move to sort of sidle up with Sloterdijk is very interesting too, because Sloterdijk is fundamentally concerned with this shift from, say, nodes and networks uh, to spheres, so the more uh, permeable sort of bubbles that we surround ourselves with them that we make. Um, so I don't know uh, that I want to uh, critique accidental theory as much as sort of take what's useful and sort of try and move it into this sort of larger problem of, of um, what the, the sort of atmospheres that we're, we're creating or right, have created and, and sort of the sort of pressing issues that the tour brings up in uh, with Nedley Modern. So I'm uh, not quite sure I got to your question. Well, we have one so time for one oh, more. Sorry, so I'll Jay, stop. Sorry. sorry, follow up, but then we have to, we're still filming. <laughs> so uh, thank you for trying to put that back up on the screen, but it's oh. not up on the screen anymore. And I'm sorry to make you do that. I thought you were all hooked up, but I didn't realize that you were kind of straight across the down. Anyway, so um, I, I. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and there have him rise from the bottom. <laughs> so um, I, I absolutely loved your, your talk. and. I thought that the use of the kind of actor network theory and the rise of history as a form of design studies was like was so interesting and inspiring and um, and so uh, but it, then I came to this moment and and it was a bit of grit for me in a funny way. This moment. This moment. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's <laughs> <And>, uh, <laughs> 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 just gone. I mean, it's there. It's just gone. I end my question. Um, so. If we, so, and I want to just contextualize it that way because, again, I, I thought your presentation was spectacular, but this kind of bugged me. So, if you used Hebsner as a whipping boy for his kind of universalization of um, the human subject um, and kind of looking at design in that way, why do we let Tony Fry say uh, all that humanity attempts to regulate is at odds with the world that actually regulates us? I mean, if there isn't a broader, more universalizing statement. Um, I haven't seen it recently. I mean, that is that is as ridiculous, if not more so, than Hebsner. And so I just, and, and, and I think it's completely at odds with the very textural, kind of almost, you know, sort of intensely theoretical slash journalistic um, design histories and design studies that you gave as examples in your presentation. And so I'm just kind of pondering then, why do we let Tony Fry go scot-free? <laughs> and beat up Nicholas Pepsner? Are, is it that academics just like the bitter, angrier sentimentality of Tony Fry? Are we comfortable with that? Are we uncomfortable with the kind of positive Pepsner? Um, or what, like, so, and, and then, you know, I see Tony Fry's kind of angry visage come up from the bottom and, and that pose of, you know, kind of uh, that kind of aggressive pose in this picture. And it just was, it just struck me that somehow we're really comfortable with that and we can leave that alone and say, you know, 
he's fine because he recognizes all the idiots that made all the mistakes. Hefner somehow is wrong because he thinks people actually did things in ways that improved life or something. Is there something in our disposition and in the academy that can't, can't kind of maybe give a free pass to the, to the negative critique and we kind of um, have to sort of whip, up, whip upon um, the Hefner's of the world? And is there something else between those two poles? One quick response, and I think Clyde would have a great uh, uh, rejoinder because he's been working closely with Tony on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been working closely. But we had an interesting discussion about sort of modes of representing an argument. And my quick thought on that, and I really appreciate your point, it's absolutely valid, that we can't uh, whip somebody for universalizing and not another. Um, uh, I think the. Um, the sort of role of the provocateur. So Pevsner in his day was doing something quite provocative, and uh, we should sort of doff our caps to that for moving uh, design forward in that sense. And I think that's what uh, Tony is trying to do with that uh, somewhat bombastic uh, all humanity uh, phrasing, and that that has become a sort of mode of operation for him in, in, as, as, as sort of his sense of, I think, frustration that there hasn't been a shift in design, palpable shift in this new design discourse to acknowledge the sort of, sort of crisis around us. I think it's perhaps turned, it's turned up the volume on its critique. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're absolutely right to, to bring that up. And all I can say is it's a sort of, you know, the role of the provocateur that, that plays a part in it. Just think of the best way to think of Tony is as an Old Testament prophet, <laughs> the Old Testament God, not a nice New Testament. <laughs> Death.